Hey, what's up everyone? I've been using the Korg Nano Control 2 for over a year now, and I'm gonna tell you how I have it set up and why I like it in the video ahead. Let's go. So the Korg Nano Control 2 is a small eight fader, eight knob, 24 button controller with transport marker and track controls. And I've been using it for over a year and I really like it. And before I get into how I have it set up, I wanna tell you why I like it. First of all, it's small. As you can see, it's got Nano in the name, but it packs a lot of functionality into a small footprint. So on my desk, I have my keyboard, my fader controller, and then my MIDI key controller. Now it's nice because I have modulation and expression mapped to the first two faders, and I can play and have modulation right here. Uh, the mod wheel on my MIDI keyboard is way over here. So as you can see, ergonomically, it's nice to have the faders not only on the left, because I'm right-handed, but also in front of the keyboard. Board. So its small footprint is the first reason that I like it. Now some people would argue that because it's so small the faders don't have enough throw and if you're one of those people then you'll probably have to get a controller with longer faders. The second reason I like the Core Nano Control is because it's affordable. Uh, for around a hundred bucks you can get this piece of kit that packs in a lot of functionality and a lot of MIDI control, especially custom MIDI control design devices, are very expensive. This one is not. Now, the caveat to that is that some people would say that affordable is just a euphemism for cheap. And this is all plastic construction. Uh, there's no getting around the fact that it feels like a budget item. But if you can live with that and you're not too concerned with the fact that everything on it is plastic, it works. And it's so cheap that if it ever broke down due to its lack of durability, which I have not observed, it's relatively easy to replace. And the third reason that I like the Korg Nano Control 2 is it's available. You can go on any music retailer or Amazon right now and purchase it. And as a matter of fact, I will leave an affiliate link in the description for the Korg Nano Control 2. This is not a sponsored video uh, and the price will be the same for you, but I'll get a little kickback if you do order it from the affiliate link. And I just wanna say that there are some hardware manufacturers out there that send their units out to influencers. They make videos touting how great they are and it's to drum up pre-orders and then the product never ships. And that seems like bad business to me. Korg has been in business a long time. The products are available on the market right now. You can buy them, you don't have to pre-order them. They come with software that has been maintained since the device was released. There's a lot of reasons to go with a trusted company that's been in business for a long time. And for those three reasons, I do like the Korg Nano Control 2. So let's get into how I set it up. We're actually going to start in the Korg Control Editor. So this is the configurator software for the Korg Control Editor. And I will say Steinberg provides a script for the Nano Control 2. The problem is that the script for the Nano Control 2 overwrites the data that you put in through this configurator when Cubase starts, it takes control. So I use a custom script that I designed myself so that I can add this functionality. So on this first fader right here, I do not want it to be CC number zero. I want it to be modulation, which is CC number one. And on the second fader, which is modulation, I want it to be CC number 11, which is expression. Now, anyone who's ever programmed string libraries in MIDI knows that CC one and CC 11 are the most important controls to have to control modulation and expression in a string library. Now out of the box, this comes mapped from zero to seven. I've changed the mapping to have be one, 11, two, three, four, five, six. And that's all I need to do in this. And in order to write it to the uh, device, I just go to communication up here, write scene data. This will rewrite all data on the device. Are you sure? Yes. So now I have my CCs mapped the way I want to. And the Steinberg script that comes concluded doesn't allow this configurability. So you'll have to do the core control editor to map the CCs the way you want them. And then you'll be able to write your own custom script or create your own MIDI remote in Cubase. So the next thing we'll do is open Cubase and I'll show you my script. Here's the nano control as I have it set up. And if you go to open MIDI remote manager, you can see the scripts. And here, where's Korg? You see, I have the Nano Control 2 script disabled, and uh, I use the Nano Control 2 script that's my own personal script in the local folder 
for use with this nano control too. I'm not gonna get into how to add the buttons, but if you're mapping it yourself, it's pretty self-explanatory. You can have buttons, faders, knobs, and I believe that's all you'll need. You can adjust the size of each to make it look like your hardware. There's plenty of videos on this. I'm not going to do that video today. I'm just going to show you how I have my specific script set up because this is what works for me. So these two buttons here are track up and down. And if I use those, you can see you can move through your project track by track. And I don't really use that. I just use the mouse to select the track, but those are what that says the functionality of the buttons are. And the next one is cycle here. So you can set your markers and then add cycle. And then if you have a marker track, the way I have this set up is add position marker on active track. So if I set this, push this button here, I can set a marker anywhere that the cursor is. Boom, boom, boom. And then these buttons, locate previous marker and locate next marker, allow me to put the cursor on each marker left or right by pushing those buttons. Now, these two buttons on the hardware are rewind and fast forward, so it would look like this if I'm using key commands. I don't like that because of the lack of granular control, so I have these set up to nudge cursor left and nudge cursor right. Each button push gives me a bar, and I find that more useful. So if I wanna go back four bars, I go back four bars. If I wanna go forward four bars, and of course this will change with how you have your grid set up. So if you're using quantize, it'll go forward a 16th note. But I just find that more useful because I can use the key commands to rewind and fast forward. It's nice to have a dedicated go back a bar or a beat or a subdivision of a beat. So I have those two set up that way. I have stop, play, and record, obviously. Uh, this first button here, I can set my left locator. And the second button here, I can set my right locator. So if I'm doing a loop, I can start at the ninth bar, set my left locator, go to the 17th bar, set my right locator, hit cycle, boom. It's pretty easy. And then this last key command that I have is duplicate selected tracks without data, which is a very powerful key command, especially if someone's not used to Cubase's monitoring system, or they're not used to a, even a tape machine style playback monitoring system. You can just duplicate the whole track, have them hear the previous track and have them punch in. There's a lot of uses for duplicate selected track without data, and it's a macro, so I have that assigned to a dedicated key control. And those are the only buttons I have mapped. Then we have the first two faders, which I have set to CC1 and CC11. And we can see that if I go to a MIDI monitor, my first fader is CC1, my second fader is CC11, boom. And that's really useful for string libraries. So if I just play a little bit, You can see that expression is useful for programming strings. And the final thing that I have mapped on the faders is the final fader I have linked to track volume. So if you watch me move this, you'll see over here, it also moves. And that's pretty cool. And you can also see over here, it also moves. And that just gives me, on the selected track, I can control the volume. I can do automation that way. I usually just draw in curves, but it allows me to have fader control of the track volume that's selected. The other ones are not mapped, but I will use these five that are left over for MIDI learn functions, if I wanna MIDI learn something. And then all eight knobs are mapped to the focus quick control. So focus quick controls occur on tracks and on instruments. If I click this QC button here, it'll tell me what the quick controls are. And if I move them, you can see them moving in real time. And people complain about the quick controls as opposed to a dedicated MIDI learn feature, but I don't mind it because I'm never really wanting to control eight parameters in real time or more than eight parameters in real time. So the quick controls work for me. And that is the entirety of my setup. Now in the Cubase script, and I will add that Cubase script real quick, we'll disable this one and we'll enable the one that comes with Steinberg. Media Technologies. This is the one that you can just add if you don't wanna do any of this faffing about. It comes with all of these 
functions previously mapped. Uh, you can change the function on each button, uh, but it becomes more difficult to make these uh, CC1 and CC11. You'll have to use a MIDI transformer and that gets a little complicated and it transforms all of your MIDI devices. So I would suggest you do it my way, but you can do this if you don't care about CC1 and CC11 and it gives you some additional pages. Uh, so there's the focus quick controls and then these faders are unmapped and you can assign the buttons to whatever you want. And it also gives you a mixer page. So whatever tracks you have will get added to the mixer, the first eight tracks, I believe, a selected track page and EQ of selected track page. Now, if we go back to my script, you'll notice that using the Steinberg script has changed the mapping. Uh, so now my second fader is CC1 and my first fader doesn't work at all. That's why you have to use the core configurator before you go into Cubase, because if you use the Steinberg script, it will overwrite data on the unit itself and you'll be unable to do it this way. So just keep that in mind if you're trying to switch between scripts. So on my configuration, I only have the one page, but if I wanted to add pages, I would just go in here and click this plus button. I could add a new page name. I could add whatever parameters I wanted to. I don't want to do that. I find that less is more. The fewer functions that I have to remember that are mapped to a MIDI controller. I don't want faffing about to be on the wrong page when I want to do something. So it really only has these features that I've shown you today, but I feel like those features are enough. They're worth the price of admission for the Korg Nano Control, and I do enjoy using it. And that's about all I have for today. If you like this video, feel free to like or subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.